I am an emergency physician, uh, an associate professor of emergency medicine at Brown, the director of our Brown Lifespan Center for Digital Health, and the chief research officer for Affirm Research, a nonprofit committed to creating a public health approach to violence. And that's what we want to talk about. Why do you consider and a growing number of people consider gun violence to be a public health issue as opposed to any other kind of issue? Yeah, so gun violence has been a problem in the United States for quite a while. Um, it got better for a little bit uh, after um, the drug wars of the mid 90s um, were kind of calmed down. Uh, but over the last decade, the, both the number and the rate of gun deaths has increased inexorably year after year. And when you look at the definition of an epidemic, gun violence really meets every part of that definition. It's more cases than we would expect, concentrated among certain populations um, and concentrated among certain geographic areas. Um, moreover, the effects of firearm injury are clearly health-related problems, right? It's not only death, but also injury, mental health effects, um, and many long-term uh, consequences for those who do survive, both the actual victims um, and their families. Finally, we have a long history of addressing problems like firearm injury as public health problems. And when we apply that public health lens, we're successful in decreasing the number of injuries and deaths from things like car crashes, drownings. Um, obviously here in Rhode Island, we talk a lot about the opioid epidemic. So we see all the ways that the public health approach works. Um, and those are the reasons why we're calling for it to be addressed as a public health problem. It, meets the definition of an epidemic, it uh, is a health problem, and it can be solved when we apply that public health lens. And I'm happy to talk a little more about what a public health approach actually looks like. Sure, go ahead, please. So the public health approach at its core is really a four-step process, Wayne. So the first step is measuring who's getting hurt or killed, and why. And one important thing that I'll say about this um, for firearm injury is that, you know, we talk about gun violence in the media. And when we talk about that, we think about gang wars or shootings in cities. Mm -hmm. But the reality is that across the United States, and even here in Rhode Island, most gun deaths are actually suicide. And so what a lot of us do is we actually talk about firearm injury instead of gun death, because it includes more explicitly all those types of, of um, side effects of, of firearms. So first, anyways, the first step is we measure what's happening and who's affected. The second step is we look at risk and protective factors. So who's getting hurt and why? Are there reasons why some people escape injury or if they do have an injury that they do okay? Um, are there things that put someone at risk? And then the third step is you create interventions. So you say, what can we do to modify that risk? Let's talk about how we can change behavior, how we can get people that are high risk to put distance between them and the gun um, so that they don't hurt others or themselves. We design those interventions and then we move into the fourth step of the public health approach, which is we make sure that those interventions work. And when they do work, we spread them, but we don't do things just based on emotional gut response. We do it because it actually makes a difference. And when you apply that four step approach over and over across history, it works. And, you know, we can see that with COVID about the places where we've successfully applied the public health approach and it has actually made a difference. You know, here in our own state, we've really gotten it under control by applying that basic approach. Again, we've done it for car crashes. We've done it for HIV AIDS. We've used that scientific approach to make a difference. And uh, we're only just starting now to use that for gun violence and, and firearm injury. So. Why, why has gun violence increased over the last several years? What are, what are the factors involved, number one? And then number two, who is most at risk? Great questions. So the factors involved in the increase in number of firearm injuries and deaths are multiple. And one of the problems, Wayne, is that because we haven't had a lot of good research or a very strong public health approach across this country, it's actually difficult to answer that question definitively. We have a lot of theories about why the number of gun deaths have increased. We think it's related to increased hopelessness, um, lack of community cohesion, um, lack of people looking out for each other, uh, easy access to firearms for those who shouldn't have them, 
who are high risk of hurting themselves or others. Um, we think that those are all factors, but we can't say that there's a single one and the research is still kind of out there as to what the, you know, the most important cause is. And I'll be honest, the cause is probably a little different for different populations, uh, but there is certainly all of those. And then who's at risk? There's two groups who we know are most at risk, but then there are other smaller groups as well. So the two groups who are most at risk are young minority men who are disproportionately affected by gun violence. That's predominantly the things, the shootings and the murders that we've had in the city of Providence over the past, and, and Pawtucket and Central Falls over the past couple of months. Um, they uh, have 20 times the risk of being killed um, compared to white men of the same age. Um, and that's caught in a um, complicated uh, kind of set of social factors, um, employment opportunities, um, uh, relationships with the police. There's a lot of different things going on there. The other group at tremendously high risk is older white men. And actually well over two thirds of gun deaths nationally, as well as um, in, within the state of Rhode Island are um, middle-aged white men. Um, and that's largely because of suicide, but also homicide. Um, and so that group is also at tremendously high risk. Other groups um, that are at risk uh, are women who are victims of domestic violence, um, are at much higher risk of gun homicide. Um, young kids um, and also adolescents, we're seeing increasing risk of gun suicide, um, as well as of course the public mass shootings that we're also concerned about um, and unintentional injuries, which are very uncommon um, on a national level, but which correlate with a kid having access to a gun that has not been um, safely stored. Um, and then the last group that we're looking at that's at increasing risk are older adults with cognitive decline, older adults with dementia or Alzheimer's, um, who, you know, about 40% of Americans have a gun in their home. And if you have a gun in your home and you have dementia um, and you're getting paranoid or you're depressed, um, you're at increased risk of suicide or of hurting someone else. So that's the last group that we're paying a lot of attention to right now and trying to help decrease risk for those older adults. What are you seeing uh, both in Rhode Island and nationally uh, in, in terms of the pandemic? Have we seen an increase in gun violence during the pandemic? Yeah, so anecdotally, um, we've seen an increase in gun homicides, uh, both in our own state and on a national level um, during COVID-19. And we think that that is for a few reasons. The first is people are home and they don't have anything to do and people are stressed tensions are high, people are hopeless, and people have lost their jobs. So we have this perfect storm of all of the horrible uh, factors that drive people to hurt each other. Uh, so it's not particularly surprising to many of us that work in the area of violence, um, but it is disheartening, especially here in Providence, where we've done such a good job over the last um, decade in, in decreasing the number of gun homicides. In terms of gun suicide, um, we are hearing anecdotally that there are increases, but those numbers we don't have yet. You know, we have crime reports um, for, for the gun homicides, um, but the suicides we're not gonna know definitely whether they've increased or not for um, a few months yet, um, because we really depend more on medical examiner data there to be able to say that. But many of us suspect that again, because of those factors of hopelessness and loneliness, during COVID-19 um, that we are going to see increases. And I'll say it's why it's today that we're talking is actually World Suicide Prevention Day. Um, and I'll, I'll kind of make a plea that for any of us that do have guns in our home to keep an eye out for our friends and family members um, who may live with us or for friends and family members who may own guns for signs of depression or suicidal thoughts. The very best thing you can do for them is to A, listen, but to me, B, make sure that they don't have easy access to that firearm in that moment of depression and impulsivity. If you can separate them from their firearm temporarily, um, not permanently, but just temporarily until they can get help, you can potentially save their life. So th there's an example of an intervention, a public health intervention that can work. What are some of the other initiatives or interventions bringing us toward the goal of reducing gun violence through the lens of public health? Oh. So Wayne, there are so many. And for those of your listeners who are interested in learning more, I and others have actually written extensively about um, the many interventions that we're trying to make sure work before we put them into effect on a national basis. So some of them, that lethal means counseling, so identifying 
folks who are at risk of suicide and making sure that their guns are stored safely either outside of the house or in a lockbox that they don't have the key to. Um, and we're looking at ways to help that to happen uh, most efficiently and most respectfully. Um, another thing is things like bystander intervention trainings where we teach people um, in, uh, who are gun owners in the gun owning community what to look out for in terms of warning signs. Um, you know, at Affirm, my co-founder, uh, Dr. Chris Barsati, is a rifle safety instructor himself and talks about how there are members of his gun club that he watches out for um, and, and has actually intervened with. You know, as an emergency physician, I see all the time people that are getting brought in um, for uh, mental health checks, for depression. Um, and one of the things that I can do there is to, again, watch out for warning signs and know how to help them. So that's another type of intervention that we can do is to have those bystander interventions to help people do the right thing for their friends, their family members, their patients. There's a whole field of um, harm reduction counseling that we can do as physicians, and many of us are working on that. Um, again, it's about respecting someone's choice to own a gun, but also making sure that for those high-risk groups that there is time and space between them and access to the gun. Um, and then uh, another important thing is, of course, violence intervention programs. I mentioned earlier how um, uh, young minority men are at disproportionately increased risk of gun homicide. There are a lot of great interventions that we can do to reduce that. Here in Rhode Island, we have the Institute for the Study and Practice of Nonviolence. I'm lucky enough to be on their board. Um, and they're doing great work to interrupt the cycle of violence within communities, to interrupt that retaliation. Um, those are all, those are just a few of the many uh, public health strategies that many of us across the country are currently testing to see how well they work and for whom, so that we can then spread them and hopefully make a difference um, for people both across our state and across the country. And I'm going to guess that you can go to the Affirm website and see more detail. That's absolutely correct. So it's Affirm, A-F-F-I-R-M, research.org. Just two more questions. One, as an ER doctor, you have obviously seen victims of, of gun violence. What is that like on an emotional level? Mm. So, um, it is one of the, up until COVID-19, I would have said it was the toughest part of the job. Um, I actually think it prepared me for COVID. That hopelessness, that fear, um, it is the same feeling. It's that feeling of taking care of someone and I know what to do from a trauma perspective, but all the stuff that brought them there and all the stuff that comes next often feels so out of my control. And having to tell a family member, um, that they've lost a loved one to gun violence is one of the toughest parts of my job because it's just an instant. And it's so often um, so unpredictable uh, to the family. They, they had no inkling um, that this was going to happen. Um, and it, it's so, there's nothing you can do to get them back. Uh, so, it's, it's, it's tremendously um, emotional and uh, frustrating because from, again, from that public health perspective, I can look at it and say, we could have prevented this. Um, but on the, in the individual patient experience, it's too often too late. And um, the, the trauma of gun violence extends clearly beyond the victim, him or herself. It includes medical professionals such as yourself who have to treat or watch people die. It includes family members and relatives and friends. It's a, it's a fairly large, it's not just one person is what I'm trying to say here. That's absolutely right, Wayne. Um, the ripple effects of every bullet that, are, that is shot are so wide. So even if that bullet doesn't connect with another human being, just the mere fact that it's shot affects the community. We know that kids that grow up in neighborhoods with high rates of gun violence have higher rates of post-traumatic stress, higher rates of medical problems, higher rates of substance use just from the stress of being exposed to it. Certainly for family members, um, knowing that your kid or your loved one was shot, whether or not they survive, that changes your entire life going forwards. If you do have a victim who survives, they're living with permanent medical problems often, again, post-traumatic stress, um, a, work problems, a host of other issues. Uh, and then, yeah, for the first responders um, and for physicians and other healthcare professionals in the hospital, 
Um, it's a contributor to burnout, to secondary victimization or PTSD. You know, I do a lot of talks for healthcare professionals about how to identify who's at risk and how to help our patients who are at risk from, from being um, uh, victims of, of firearm injury. And I often have folks come up to me afterwards and share stories um, of victims of gun violence who they've treated, stories that they can't normally share because of you know, HIPAA. Um, we, we can't talk about them and we feel like we shouldn't be affected, but these are the stories that we all carry with each other um, or with ourselves um, and that just change our relationship um, a little bit and in a sad way, but change our relationship with, with humanity. So there is this huge, huge ripple effect. Um, and that's not even mentioning the economic costs, right? The, the, the healthcare costs, the criminal justice costs, um, the lost work costs for society. And this all stems from a very simple action, which is pulling the trigger of a loaded gun aimed at someone. That's exactly right. And if you actually look at the basic precepts of firearm ownership, right, one of the first ones is to not aim your gun at someone unless you really mean to hurt them. <laughs> and to never have your finger on the trigger of a loaded firearm. Um, and yet we so often forget that. And we forget to protect those amongst us that are most vulnerable and at risk. And you can respect the right to own firearms, but also respect that there are some people in some moments who shouldn't be behind a loaded gun. Some people will think of this or read this and may think, oh, here we go. Somebody's trying to take my guns. That's not at all. And, and, and to me, that seems a very important point. Just talk about that. You're not trying to grab people's guns. Oh, God, no. I, and, and again, you know, if you look at my work with Affirm Research, um, again, my co-founder is himself a gun owner and a rifle safety instructor. And that is really one of our basic underlying principles that we are not going to make progress on this issue as long as we keep it an us versus them issue. If you look at the work that I did with Colonel Jim Manny um, on our governor's gun safety task force, right? He's a former secret service agent. He actually worked with my uncle uh, decades ago um, and is now um, running our, our, our state police. Um, he respects firearms more than just about anybody that I know, both for their good and for their bad. And until we engage um, folks that uh, own firearms, believe in firearm ownership, live in a culture of gun ownership, there is absolutely no way that we are going to make progress on this issue. It cannot be about us versus them. And although policies can certainly be important, we have never in our history fixed a public health problem simply with legislation. And when we get stuck in this debate about gun control versus gun rights, we lose sight of this entire public health approach, which is about behavior modification, which is about putting space and time between people who are high risk and the means of harm. You know, when we look at how we've decreased car crashes, it's not by taking cars off the road. But there's actually more cars being driven and more millions of miles being covered each year than ever before. And yet we decrease the number of deaths by car crashes by more than 70% mm -hmm. by applying this public health approach, by making cars safer, by making drivers safer, and by making sure that a very few people temporarily maybe can't drive, whether it's because they have severe dementia or because they have a seizure disorder or because they keep doing things that are dangerous to the rest of society like drunk driving. And there is a way that we can change this conversation, which is about behavior modification and that public health approach, um, which is what I believe in and which is what most of the people that I work with believe in too. Um, and I would love to see those terms, gun control and gun rights kind of go away and for us instead to focus on, on injury reduction and, and injury um, prevention instead.